This week brought more mixed signals about the economy. As Fed Chair Ben Bernanke put it, the current economic climate is unusually uncertain. And with spending fatigue on Capitol Hill, President Obama is running out of options to give the recovery a boost. And that's where I began my interview with Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. Secretary Geithner, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. So the administration has had a number of successes after big battles. Stimulus, health care legislation, new rules for Wall Street, but you have a big battle coming when it comes to the Bush tax cuts. Uh, if they remain in place as Republicans want, it will cost $3 trillion over 10 years. Uh, the administration has said it wants to keep the ones for people who make under $200,000 a year, individuals, and $250,000 for couples. That will cost $2.5 trillion over 10 years. Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that with the economic outlook unusually uncertain, extending the Bush tax cuts would have a stimulative effect on the economy. Is he right? I don't think it should be a battle, Jake. You know, what the president's proposing to do is to leave in place to extend tax cuts that go to more than 95 percent of working Americans and to leave in place tax cuts that are very important to incent businesses to hire new, pe new employees and to invest uh, in expanding output. We think that's a, the, it's a very strong package. We think it's the right package. We think it's fair. We think it's responsible. Now, we also think it's responsible to let the tax cuts it's expire that just go to 2 to 3 percent of Americans, the highest earning Americans. We think that's the responsible thing to do because we need to make sure we can show the world that they're w we're willing as a country now to start to make some progress bringing down our long our long term deficits. Don't you think it will slow economic growth? No, just letting those tax cuts that only go to 2 to 3 percent of Americans, the highest earning Americans in the country expire, I do not believe would have a negative effect on growth. This package that you're talking about pushing in Congress to, to save the Bush tax cuts for people under $200,000 individuals and two fifty dollars for And in fact, yeah, we go beyond that because, you know, we're proposing to extend the make work pay tax cut, which also goes to 95 percent of working Americans, and a set of very important business tax cuts targeted for small businesses themselves, expensing uh, zero capital gains rate for investment in small businesses. Uh, these things we think are very helpful, very powerful. And when are you talking about pushing that in, into Congress? Well, Congress is on the verge of what we hope will be enactment of a very strong package of tax measures for small businesses and ways to help them get credit so they can expand. So before the election? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. A number of Senate Democrats, uh, moderate Senate Democrats, have said that they oppose uh, repealing or allowing to expire the Bush tax cuts on the wealthiest Americans, that they think that would be harmful to growth. Are you guys going to have the votes to get through the package you want, which is uh, focus more on middle and lower income Americans? Oh, absolutely. I believe we will. Again, because what we're proposing is very sensible. And some in the administration and internal discussions are talking about maybe uh, just keeping all the Bush tax cuts for a year or two. Those are, that's not going to happen? I don't believe it should, and I don't believe it will. Again, because what the president has proposed is to make sure we're leaving them in place for the people that need the most and can make the most difference in helping make sure this economy comes back, that we heal the damage caused by this crisis. Job creation has not gone as well as you hoped. What more can you do? I know there's this small business lending initiative. What more can you do given the lack of appetite on Capitol Hill for any spending programs, any more stimulus? Well, you know, the President's proposed a very strong package of help for small businesses, which you just referred to. He'd support giving more support to states so they can keep teachers in the classroom. The classroom we $50 think that's billion dollars in emergency spending, but, but Congress has not acted on that. Kind they haven't of. yet, but we think there's a good case for doing it, and they're gonna, we're going to keep at that. Uh, but right now, the best thing the government can do, in addition to those things, is help create the conditions for the private sector to start to invest and hire again. Now, we've seen six months of positive job growth by the private sector. That's pretty good. By the pretty private good, sector. Pretty good this early in a, re in a recession. Although if you count in the public sector with the layoffs and the census jobs. But only because of census. But you know, what mm -hmm. matters is, is the private sector starting to hire people, add back hours, uh, and that's what's critical. And you're seeing that happen now. Now, we want, it to, we want to see it happen at a faster pace. But I think most people understand that you know, this was a deep crisis. The scars ran very deep, devastating damage. It's going to take time to repair that damage, take time to grow out of this. Uh, but we're making progress. In 2009, when President Obama talked about unemployment insurance extension, he talked about how it was paid for. This time, it was not paid for. Uh, the $34 billion in unemployment insurance extensions became added to the national debt. Republicans on Capitol Hill argued that they wanted to pay for it, 
uh, and they, su they supported it, but they just wanted it offset by spending cuts. Given the fact that we're going to be, we're going to have unemployment for the foreseeable future, high unemployment, isn't it the fiscally responsible thing to do to not treat this as emergency spending, but treat this as something we know is coming down the pike so we're not just laying this burden on uh, our future generations? I, I don't think so. In a crisis that was this bad, in a recession that was that deep, with this amount of lasting damage, scars from recovery, it's appropriate to treat these things as emergencies. Many of the details on the Wall Street reform bill that President Obama just signed uh, will be determined by regulators. In fact, the, the bill also gives more power to some regulators, um, some of the same ones who failed us the last time around. Why should we be confident that they're going to get it right, either with the rulemaking or next time there's a crisis? Excellent question. But actually, the theory, the basic strategy in this re reform bill does not rest on the wisdom of regulators. It does two very important things, though. It'll help consumers make better choices with better disclosure, much more clarity about the terms of a credit card contract or a mortgage loan, so they get better protection against the risk of being taken advantage of. But it also gives authority we did not have to put in place strong constraints on risk taking on all the nation's largest institutions. That authority did not exist before, and it was central to what caused the near collapse of the financial system. Would these powers have allowed you, if you had been Treasury Secretary at the time, or your predecessor, Hank Paulson, to have staved off the financial crisis? I don't think there's any reform bill, no law in any country, that can prevent all financial crises. But if we had had this authority as a country, it, we would have been able to limit risk taking and deal with the trauma that came from the mistakes these firms made much more easily. It would have caused much less damage. It would have been much less severe, caused much less damage to the basic fortunes of Americans, to businesses across the country, and to our, you know, our long-term fiscal position. You alluded to uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that was created. Uh, many liberals and labor unions and consumer groups say there's one person they want for that job, Elizabeth Warren, the woman who thought it up. Do you support that idea? She is an enormously effective advocate for reform, probably the most effective advocate for, for, for reform for consumers, for consumer protection in the country. She has huge credibility, and she played a decisive role in helping make the public case for reform. And she was early on this, way ahead of everybody else. 2007, out, she wrote that, that she, yeah. she came up with And even idea. before that, she was pointing out to people the risks of what was happening in the housing market and credit markets. So she has enormous credibility, and she'd be an excellent leader of that institution. But that's a decision the president's going to make. Some in the White House say that, that you've had concerns about her appointment because she's been a sharp critic of you. She's been a sharp critic of Treasury Department policies. Do you have concerns? I don't have concerns. And I should say in that context that she has been played a very important role in providing oversight over the programs we put in place to break the back of this financial crisis, you know, put out this financial fire. Ken Feinberg uh, issued a report concluding that U.S. banks paid out $1.6 billion in unwanted, uh, unwarranted bonuses to top earners during the height of the meltdown. Uh, 17 banks made these payouts after getting TARP funds, after it, getting bailout funds. It's an, you know, it really is an incredible thing, and that's what he reminded of, which is in early 09, on the basis of performance in 08, in the middle of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, firms that had taken support from the government, because they could not manage without it, still paid out substantial sums of money to people who made the decisions that caused the crisis. Is there nothing that can be done about this? Well, you know, he spoke to that uh, earlier this week. What he did do, though, and this is enormously effective, was he went and used the authority he had to change behavior going forward. So you didn't have taxpayers' money after he had that authority go to enrich the people that had brought the system to the edge of collapse. Now, what he's also done, and what our responsibility is to make sure that these firms can never again go back to paying their executives to take risks that could imperil uh, the, the stability of the country as a whole, the economy as a whole. So he's done a great job, very tough judgments, limited authority in some cases, but he uses authority very well. Why is it that U.S. automakers, when they received bailout funds, had to take serious steps to take what are called haircuts, uh, salary reductions, layoffs, and banks didn't? Banks. I mean, you had Ken Feinberg supervising their salaries as long as they were receiving TARP money, but then they paid the money back and they did whatever they wanted. How come banks didn't have to do that? Great question, and that's why we have financial reform, because we had, for the country as a whole, a process of bankruptcy for dealing with failure. We did not have a similar process that could deal with the failure of large financial institutions 
that was a tragic failure for the country because what it meant is when firms like AIG or Lehman or Bear Stearns managed themselves to the point where they could not survive without the government, we had no tools like bankruptcy to force them to restructure and protect the taxpayer from losses. But what this financial reform do is to give us that authority, a type of bankruptcy regime that we can use for these large institutions because, again, this is a basic commitment in the bill. Banks should be paying for the cost of bank failures. We don't want the taxpayer paying for the cost of bank failures. And we should have the ability to dismember them, put them out of existence, put them out of their misery without it causing catastrophic damage to the economy as a whole. Lastly, this has been a, a, an odd week for the Obama administration, not necessarily for the Treasury Department, but for the Obama administration, uh, given the whole kerfuffle with Shirley Sherrod and, and the Agriculture Department. President Obama has said this is a teaching moment for him and his administration. Uh, to Secretary Vilsack said something similar. Did you learn anything from watching your colleagues go through this? Uh, well, as the President said, you know, you, I think you saw a general rush to judgment everywhere in the press and um, outside the press. And I think I agree that it's, it's something that we should all take some caution from and look at these things carefully. But he spoke to that, I thought, well, Jake, earlier, earlier this week. Secretary Geithner, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jake.